David Blunkett resigns from the cabinet for a second time. He decides to call it a day after admitting he broke the rules on his business dealings. I am guilty of a mistake and I am paying the price for it and I make no bones about saying that that is my fault. Tony Blair loses one of his key allies and finds his own judgment called into question. We have seen the slow seepage of his authority turn into a hemorrhage. Yeah. We'll be assessing what the resignation is likely to mean for the Prime Minister. Also tonight, a major climb down on the new anti-terror laws is forced on ministers. No prison for the mother who admitted killing her Down syndrome son. And a warm welcome at the White House today for Charles and Camilla. And in BBC London news, preparing for civil disorder, the police respond to a potential fallout from a flu pandemic and honouring the man who saved Buckingham Palace from a German bomber. Good evening. For the second time in a year, David Blunkett has left the Cabinet. He resigned as Work and Pension Secretary to be replaced by John Hutton. Mr Blunkett, who had faced persistent allegations about his business interests, said he regretted any embarrassment he'd caused the Prime Minister, whose own judgment has now been called into question by the Conservatives. First tonight, our political editor, Nick Robinson, reports. You're an embarrassment to the Prime Minister, Mr Blunkett. The answer to that question was yes. What David Blunkett didn't know when he left home this morning was that Tony Blair had already concluded that he couldn't survive. Mr Blunkett was supposed to be heading to an appearance before a Commons committee. When he failed to turn up on time, we at Westminster sensed that something was up. David Blunkett was scheduled to appear before the Work and Pension Select Committee. Nick Robinson is on the phone, as I say. Nick, is he there? No, and that is a fascinating fact. David Blunkett is not only not there, he is at 10 Downing Street, I'm told. When he left number 10, by the back door of course, he hadn't been sacked and he'd not resigned. On his journey to the Commons, he decided though that he had to go. Lucky really, because the word was already out that he had gone and his committee appearance had been cancelled. So, it was back once more to number 10 to say his formal farewell. This, the last time he'd be there as a minister. Come round this other side. Political death is a horribly public affair. David Blunkett knew it because he'd been through this once before. This time, though, he knew there would be no coming back. There were no tears now, just quiet resignation to his fate. I stepped down today precisely to protect the government from diversion, from the policies that we're carrying out, from the reformers we're bringing in. He had, he admitted, broken the ministerial code by failing to seek advice before taking three different jobs when he was out of office. So I am guilty of a mistake and I am paying the price for it and I make no bones about saying that that is my fault uh, and I stand by it. Resignation, he said, had been on his mind since last week. You've been in politics as long as I have. You can smell and feel when it is right to step away. The Blunkett soap opera has filled the papers on and off for more than a year. The tale of one man and his dog, his lover and his wealthy friends simply became too much for government to bear. That still left Tony Blair to face Prime Minister's questions to explain why he couldn't hold on to a man he consistently defended. Whatever mistakes my right honourable friend has made, I've always believed and believe now that he's a decent and honourable man who has contributed a great deal to his country, who has overcome immense challenges that frankly would have daunted the rest of us. But the Tory leader was not interested in today's political victim. Sensing blood, he wanted to make sure that Tony Blair would be next. And I quite understand why the Prime Minister's judgment in these last few days has been awry. I can entirely sympathise with his desire to cling on to the Right Honourable Gentleman, the member for Sheffield Brightside. Isn't it a fact that he was one of the Prime Minister's last remaining allies in the Cabinet? If you doubt that that hurt, just look at the faces of the Deputy Prime Minister and the Chancellor of the Exchequer. My right honourable friend, my right honourable friend resigned for the reasons that he gave, that it became impossible for him, frankly, with the frenzy surrounding um, him and his job, for him to carry on doing that job properly. 
as he goes from government, we should say he goes, in my view, with no stain of impropriety against him, whatever. This week marks the beginning of the final chapter of his administration. For how long will this country have to put up with this lame duck Prime Minister in office but not in power? In David Blunkett's old office tonight is the new Secretary of State for Work Mr. and Hunnelly Pensions, work, John Hutton. Sir, sir. Mr Blunkett himself tonight waved goodbye to his old department, to his political career and to the hopes and dreams he once had. Nick Robinson, BBC News, Westminster. Well, David Blunkett's long career started in local politics and by the time New Labour came to power in 1997, he was established as one of the party's star performers. His resignation today marks the end of a remarkable career which culminated, of course, in his period as Home Secretary. As Sean Lay now reports. David Blunkett has been one of the government's most recognisable and most influential figures. It was a gamble to give him a second chance, but Tony Blair admired the determination which brought the working class boy from Sheffield to one of the highest offices in the land. The young Blunkett grew up in poverty. The death of his father left his mother practically penniless. Aged four, the local council sent him to a boarding school for the blind. This little lad couldn't cling on, he had to realise that he was now going to have to fend for himself. Intelligence and tenacity overcame those early disadvantages. He was leader of the council in his 30s and a national figure soon after. Eventually, the darling of the left would evolve into one of the sharpest brains in New Labour. When the party returned to power, Blunkett was one of the beneficiaries in charge of education, Tony Blair's top priority. Soon he was promoted. What does Home Secretary have to do? Look stern and happy at the same time. <laughs> he shared the Prime Minister's impatience with judges and enthusiasm for the police. Mr Blair felt his instinct for what ordinary voters wanted was second to none. Then he met Kimberly Quinn. They had a son together, but once their relationship disintegrated, the bitterness would colour the rest of his political career. At first, colleagues sympathised as he endured a relentless series of lurid revelations, but when his biographer revealed disparaging remarks he'd made about fellow ministers, support fell away. Newspapers claim Blunkett helped Kimberly Quinn's nanny to get a visa. He said he hadn't, but a Home Office official marked no favours but slightly quicker on the paperwork. The revelation proved fatal. Indirectly, the love affair had led to his downfall. I misunderstood what we had. I misunderstood that someone could do this not just to me but to the little one as well because there will be years to come. So. The anguish of the weeks I've just had, and they have been, the worst of my life. Yet within six months he was back at a Whitehall desk again. Tony Blair must have hoped that any future controversies would be political ones. But he was soon under siege. Newspapers were fascinated by his membership of an upmarket club, his friendship with a younger woman and the jobs he'd taken whilst out of government. The editor of his local paper blames the legacy of the affair with Kimberly Quinn. But there may be some financial aspects of this where he was, he was trying to retain an inheritance for his, uh, for his sons which uh, he'd had to spend on a court case. So the two are inextricably linked really. In eight years resignations have robbed Tony Blair of many of his closest allies. David Blunkett was given a second chance. Tonight few expect him to get a third. Sean Lay, BBC News, Westminster. As Sean was saying, as the New Labour project unfolded during the mid-1990s, David Blunkett proved to be one of Tony Blair's most loyal colleagues. And once in government, that relationship was strengthened and Mr Blunkett was promoted. Gavin Hewitt assesses the likely impact of David Blunkett's second departure on the Prime Minister, who's now lost one of his most valuable allies. Today was almost as much about Tony Blair as David Blunkett. For within minutes of the resignation, the opposition was asking what the departure of a key ally meant for the Prime Minister's authority. This has been an extraordinary week for the government and for the Prime Minister. We have seen the slow seepage of his authority turn into a hemorrhage. The Conservative leader was referring to the Cabinet, recently in disarray over smoking legislation and also divided over key education reforms. Some Labour critics also believe the Prime Minister's authority has been damaged. I think that the Prime Minister has been weakened on several fronts. This is, it's, it's cumulative. 
Other Labour MPs believe Tony Blair will find it harder to succeed with key legislation like welfare reform. It has weakened the government because David Blunkett was a very substantial figure in his own right. Uh, and there are clearly, oh, we know from the last eight years, government has difficulty in getting welfare reform through. David Blunkett's departure means Tony Blair has lost another key ally. Peter Mandelson resigned twice. Stephen Byers also had to step down. And later, Alan Milburn left front bench politics. David will, will be out of the government. That doesn't stop him being an ally and somebody that the Prime Minister can consult and somebody that the Prime Minister can talk to. And, you know, I, I think it's a pretty crude tactic by the Conservatives to suggest that David Blunkett's resignation somehow weakens the Prime Minister. is absolute nonsense. Other old allies insisted Tony Blair wouldn't be blown off course. Successful governments are the ones that set a strategic course and see it through. The government has got a strategy modernising this country, reforming the public services, modernising the economy, and that's going to carry on. The real test of the Prime Minister's authority will come in the weeks ahead with controversial measures like the reform of incapacity benefit. And the question will be, to what extent can he keep his backbenchers with him on key reforms which he regards as so important to his legacy? Gavin Hewitt, BBC News. Well, some of those Labour MPs have dealt the government a heavy blow tonight when ministers were forced to climb down over their new anti-terror laws. Faced with almost certain defeat in the Commons, ministers have agreed to look again at the highly controversial plan to allow terror suspects to be held for up to 90 days without charge. Earlier, the government's majority was cut to just one over plans to create a new offence of glorifying terrorism. Margaret Gilmore has the details. The eyes to the right, 299. The nose to the left, 300. It was the lowest Commons majority the government's had since coming to power eight years ago, scraping through with just one vote as Labour rebels joined opposition MPs, complaining a new offence of glorifying or indirectly inciting terrorism would criminalise the innocent. A teacher or tutor distributing terrorist propaganda to a class studying history in the Middle East, caught under the Act without a shadow of doubt, a broadcaster or newspaper. And that wasn't even the most controversial part of the bill. With heightened security outside the Commons, ministers inside faced their first ever potential defeat over plans to hold terrorist suspects without charge, not for 14 days as now, but for three months. The police have been pushing for this since the July attacks. They want more time to gather evidence against the modern-day terrorist who uses complex computer codes and has associates worldwide. But critics wouldn't buy it. We're talking about people being locked up all day and potentially repeatedly interviewed for a very long time before they get <laughs> released without charge because somebody finally realises they've arrested the man of a similar name or they've been misled by malicious information. Home Secretary. To avoid defeat on this, the Home Secretary finally conceded he'd have to cut the 90 days. I do regard the police persuasive case as persuasive. I think it's the right case. But I also have to acknowledge, because it's the fact, that there are strong reservations which many people have expressed. Which means he'll now have to reach a deal with opponents by next week. And they say a month should be the maximum. If there's going to be any chance of this bill getting through the House of Commons next week, it will have to change fundamentally. And any ideas that a bill with 90 days, 40 days or 30 days could get through is wrong. This is a hugely significant piece of legislation, promoted for weeks by the Prime Minister as well as the Home Secretary. The government repeatedly said there'd be no backing down over the 90 days, which makes today's climb down all the more embarrassing. Despite hours of lobbying in the corridors behind me here, the Home Secretary simply couldn't muster the support to get it through. Margaret Gilmore, BBC News, Westminster. Well, let's talk to our political editor, Nick Robinson, who's uh, at the Houses of Parliament. So on the terror laws, Nick, and uh, losing Mr Blunkett, two very heavy blows for Mr Blair in a single day. 
Not a day that he'll want to remember, no, Hugh. It would have been unfortunate simply to have lost a cabinet ally. It would have been careless on the same day to suffer your first ever parliamentary defeat on something as important as terror laws. And let's be clear, as Margaret was saying, the only reason there wasn't a defeat was because the Prime Minister climbed down, having insisted that he wouldn't climb down. Now, all this shows us, really, is that the mere exertion of the Prime Minister's will, if it ever was, is not enough now to get his own way. We heard uh, Michael Howard in the Commons uh, saying in your report there that, uh, in his view, Mr Blair's authority was ebbing away. Uh, what are the implications after today of Mr Blair's ability to drive through the programme of reforms that he has? Well, after a heady day like this, it's hard to keep perspective, but it is worth remembering. Blunkett had gone once before, so did Mandelson, so did Byers. The government rolled on. It always does. It's worth remembering that he only risked a parliamentary defeat today, I believe, so that he could point at the opposition and say it's their fault for defeating the terror laws that the intelligence services and the police really want. And yet, and yet, Hugh, what we've seen in recent days is not just the risk of parliamentary defeat, not just a cabinet minister driven from office, but also cabinet rows as well. In some ways, politics as normal, but politics as normal pre-Blair, what the Tories and previous Labour governments used to suffer. Now, they lived on, of course they did. The difference, though, is that Tony Blair wants politics not as normal now. He insists he wants reforms in education and health and welfare of the sort that even he's not been able to deliver with vast majorities for the past eight years. Now his majority is smaller, his authority is less, he is losing support in the Labour Party, he no longer has an electoral spell to cast because he won't run for office once again. That must mean... Whatever he says, however they move on from today, it will be harder to deliver what he wants to be his legacy than it was a matter of weeks ago. Nick at Westminster, thank you very much. Still ahead, the rest of the day's news, including thousands grieving for one of the giants of America's civil rights movement. And it's been another agonising night for Manchester United. A mother who killed her 36-year-old son, who had Down syndrome and autism, has been given a suspended prison sentence. Wendelin Markrow had admitted manslaughter, but she told Oxford Crown Court that she'd snapped after many years of sleepless nights caring for Patrick. The prosecution had urged the judge to consider a merciful sentence, as June Kelly now reports. Wendelin Markrow was described in court as a 100% devoted mother who snapped. Her son Patrick had Down syndrome and autism. He was constantly harming himself and would never sleep. She was his principal carer. Wendy Mark Crow has spent 36 years caring for Patrick. And during that time, she's never given a thought to herself. Giving her a suspended sentence, the judge, Mr Justice Gross, said, you'll be punished as long as you live by what you have done and what you have lost. At the family home at Long Crendon in Buckinghamshire, Wendelin Markrow gave her son tranquilizers and then suffocated him with a plastic bag. She attempted suicide. The court heard that she'd written to the local social services appealing for help. They say she turned down much of what they offered. The reason she stopped using those services was because Patrick's behaviour when he returned to her was very, very challenging, very difficult. He was very distressed. This was described in court as a highly unusual case. Nevertheless, it does raise the whole issue of the pressure on carers, particularly those with adult children who will always need somebody to look after them. Wendelin Markrow must now try to pick up her life with the rest of her family. Her husband died earlier this year. June Kelly, BBC News at Oxford Crown Court. A billion pound lawsuit against the Bank of England brought by the liquidators of the Bank of Credit and Commerce International has collapsed at the High Court in London. The liquidators withdrew their claim for compensation from the Bank of England, which they'd accused of failing to supervise BCCI's activities before it closed with enormous debts in 1991. The case is one of the most expensive in British legal history. In France, President Chirac has appealed for calm after a sixth night of rioting in the suburbs of Paris. Gangs of youths set cars alight and fought with police. The trouble started last week after the death of two teenagers apparently being chased by police officers in Clichy-sous-Bois. Let's join Richard Bilton, who's there tonight. 
Well, Hugh, it looks like the Paris suburbs are into their seventh night of confrontation. It looks quiet here, but about two streets back, about half an hour ago, the police station was attacked with stones and petrol bombs. We have seen in other areas cars on fire, gangs roaming around. It is what the authorities had feared, but had tried to prepare for. Parked up and awaiting the call. The French riot police tonight gathered in large numbers, one half of a confrontation that has lasted a week and is being watched by the whole country. It has been like this night after night. The charges and stun grenades of heavily armed police, the violence and flames of young protesters, a Paris that is rarely seen, lit up last night by more than a hundred fires. The unrest began because of the deaths of two teenagers, but it has continued for other issues, like life in these poor areas and the way people here feel they are treated. France is now unsettled and so is its government. Today, a special cabinet meeting. Now this man, Nicolas Sarkozy, is blamed by some for fueling the unrest with his tough law and order policies. He says he won't back down but today his boss became involved. President Chirac wants this to stop. He's called for calm and says it is a dangerous situation. The forgotten slums of Paris are now worrying the whole nation. Of course, unrest in the tougher areas like this is not unusual. What is unusual is a week of unrest. That's why the president is involved. That is why people are talking about the issues that people here think are important. Hugh. Richard, thank you very much. In America, thousands of mourners have attended the funeral of Rosa Parks, one of the most celebrated figures in the civil rights movement. She died last week at the age of 92. Half a century ago, it was her refusal to give up her seat on a bus for a white man which sparked the protest that led eventually to the end of segregation. The funeral was held in Detroit, Michigan, and Clive Myrie reports from there. <laughs> There are few whose passing could command such a gathering. Rosa set for me. I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Through the night, thousands waited to bid a final farewell to a humble black seamstress whose quiet strength brought profound change to the most powerful nation on earth. She gave voice to oppressed people around the world um, that it was important to stand up and to do what you know is right. The right to be here at this time and night in a city, in a group, you know, and we owe it to her. We owe it to stand here and pay our respects. She changed a nation and beliefs just because, you know, she was tired of moving to the back of the bus. 1950s Alabama, part of the segregated South where riding a bus was a daily reminder of race hate. White Americans at the front, African Americans at the back. Rosa Parks said no more. Her refusal to give up her seat to a white man brought arrest and conviction, a bus boycott, a landmark Supreme Court ruling, and the birth of a civil rights movement led by Martin Luther King. I felt that as a person, if I did not want to be mistreated, there was no way I would ever stop being mistreated if I accepted it continuously. And so to this morning, Detroit's Seven Mile Road, where they queued for one of the 3,000 coveted seats inside the Greater Grace Temple. It was a single act of defiance that changed the nation forever for the better. So today isn't just about America saying goodbye to Rosa Parks, it's about America saying thank you. Today the powerful and the famous rubbed shoulders with ordinary Americans. Everyone united in celebrating a shy, unassuming woman who sat down so others could stand up. In that simple act, and a lifetime of grace and dignity, she showed us every single day what it means to be free. She made us see and agree that everyone should be free. God bless you, Rosa. Follow that, follow that 
Aretha Franklin paid her own tribute, as did Jesse Jackson at the end of a four-hour service. Even in death, Rosa Parks broke the mold, the first woman to lie in repose on Capitol Hill. But it's her life that pricked the conscience of a nation, the seamstress who became a quiet revolutionary. Clive Myrie, BBC News, in Detroit. Tonight's football and uh, Manchester United have suffered their second defeat in four days, this time in the Champions League against Lille. The French side won 1-0 at the Stade de France in Paris and the result means that United dropped to third place in their group. Here's Andy Swiss. These are uncomfortable times for Sir Alex Ferguson. His Manchester United team are in crisis, say their critics, but others clearly weren't so impressed. And things didn't improve. Lille could have gone two up were it not for Edwin van der Sar. And what's been a bad week for United has just got even worse. Andy Swiss, BBC News. Arsenal have qualified for the last 16 of the competition with a 3-0 win over Sparta Prague at Highbury. Thierry Henry opened the scoring midway through the first half. Two goals in the closing minutes from Robin van Persie ensured that Arsenal maintained their 100% group record. Prince of Wales and the Duchess of Cornwall are in Washington on the second day of their American visit, their first official foreign tour as a couple. They had lunch at the White House with President Bush and later tonight they'll be back there for dinner as Nicholas Witchell now reports. At the gates of the White House, a solitary protester with a point to make. But the truth is, even in the United States where Diana was so popular, hardly anyone is listening now. On the South Lawn, George W. Bush, ready to receive Britain's future king and his new wife. On the balcony above, mamas come out to get a glimpse of the visitors they've all heard so much about. Up the drive sweeps a limousine flying the royal standard. The First Lady pushes the President forward to greet Charles, but it's the person emerging from the far side of the car that everyone has really come to see. The Duchess of Cornwall is said to find the attention rather nerve-wracking and perhaps little wonder, just listen to all those cameras clicking. And then there are the headlines. One New York tabloid called her a frump. Others, though, were kinder and said she'd charmed people. It was nearly time to go inside for a getting-to-know-you lunch, which must have been interesting given that Prince Charles is rather too radical for this particular president on issues like global warming and possibly even Iraq. After lunch, the couple visited a school in one of the more deprived areas of Washington, and tonight they'll be back at the White House for a formal dinner with the President and senior US officials. That dinner tonight will give Prince Charles a chance to discuss something like climate change and to explain to President Bush and his officials why he feels so strongly about it. Nicholas Witchell, BBC News, at the White House. We'll be back with the headlines in a few minutes, and on BBC News 24 later tonight... That formal dinner at the White House continued live coverage of the visit of the Prince of Wales and the Duchess of Cornwall to Washington. But here on BBC One, it's time to join our news teams across the UK. Bye for now. Good evening. Proposals have been drawn up by the police to secure doctors' surgeries and pharmacies and protect NHS premises in case of a flu pandemic. The plans will go before the police authority on Friday and may also include quarantine zones to stop a flu virus from spreading. With more details, here's Gareth Furby.